Good morning, family. Pastor Juanita, it's so good to be with you this morning. I am so grateful for God for allowing us this technology that in the midst of a global pandemic, we can still worship wherever we are as one. We continue our sermon series on hope then and hope now. This morning's message comes from Isaiah 45, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. This morning's message is entitled, Hope in the God Who Wants to Be Known by You. Isaiah 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes to open doors before him and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze. I'll cut through the bars of iron. Verse 3. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. Verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make will and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for your word. God, we ask today, especially today, that you would open our understandings that we might receive something transformative, life-changing, life-giving out of your word. Speak, Lord. We're listening. Correct our thinking transform our belief systems. Help us to be open to more expansive views of you and of ourselves in light of you. We bless you, God. We thank you for the word you'll speak to us. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway, we pray. And all the people said, amen, amen. And so I've got seven simple points, and they point to what we're talking about in the text today, and that is hope in the God who wants to be known by you. And so the seven points have to do with seven ways within this text that God is inviting Cyrus and likewise you and I to get to know God in a deeper, richer, fuller way. This passage, Isaiah 45, came to me, and I talk about it in my book, Learning to Be. It came to me during the deepest, darkest part of my depression. And it was in that space where God said to my heart, I'll give you the treasures out of the darkness. 
And let me tell you, when you are depressed and you're taking medicine, seeing the psychiatrist, seeing the psychotherapist, but you're still sleep, sleeping 18 to 20 hours a day, can't seem to get out of bed, no energy to do any of the things that you had used to define your life, even your life with God. I could not pray. I could not read Scripture. It was amazing to me that somebody said to me once, well, maybe you just need to read more Bible. They didn't understand that that part of my brain was so shut down, I couldn't read if the letters were the size of boxcars on Southern Pacific Line. And so for me, this text is transformative because in the darkest place of my life, in the dark night of my soul, this is the place where God spoke and said to me, I'll give you the treasures out of this darkness that gave me hope. You see, I didn't know what the treasures were going to be. I didn't know that later I would write a book and that in that book I would talk about the spiritual practices and the awarenesses and the moments of transformation that God allowed me to enter into. So I don't know where you are today. Maybe you too are experiencing some kind of darkness. You know, it doesn't take much these days. We're all carrying a measure of darkness with the allostatic load of a global pandemic and a political system that is yet to be reckoned. And even now, social justice needs that have not been resolved. Maybe you find yourself unemployed this morning or maybe you find yourself uh, feeling as though the dream that you had dreamed of is deferred or maybe even your sensing is denied. Maybe there's been a divorce or a death. I don't know where you are this morning. But a verse out of Isaiah 45 gave me hope in my darkest moment and my prayer for you this morning is that you too will have hope. So here are the seven points. I hope you have a pen and paper and you can jot them down. And then remember to join me Wednesday for Bible study because we're going to drill down deep into this word. Point number one comes from verse one. Matter of fact, I'll just give you all seven points and then we'll look at them. Here's the first point. God wants to use you. Number two, God offers to shepherd you. Number three, God overwhelms you with generosity. Number four, God calls and names you. Number five, God arms, strengthens, and embraces you. Verse six, number six, God makes God's self known. And lastly, verse 7, God, our creator, who is in control. So verse 1, God who wants to use you. When you read this passage, if you'll go up to verse um, chapter 44, verse 28, God is speaking and here he says, God says, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd? and he shall carry out all my purpose. And who says of Jerusalem, it shall be rebuilt. Of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Sometimes if you want to get a sense of context, go a few verses before the one you're reading. And sometimes it's a, a chapter before the one you're reading. But if you want to get some good clarity to verse 1 in chapter 45, look at verse 27. It says, God is saying that Cyrus is going to be like a shepherd, that he's going to carry out God's purpose. I want you to know that when you get to verse 1 where it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped. Here is the place where we get to see how God is wanting to not only use Cyrus, but to use us. You see, God said in chapter 44, verse 28, Cyrus doesn't know it yet, but he's going to be a shepherd. He's going to be a shepherd for my people. He's going to carry out my purpose. 
I want to say to each of you, put your name in there. Say that. Say your name. I am one that God will use to shepherd, that God will carry out God's purposes through my life. I love the fact that in verse 1 it says that God is holding Cyrus by the right hand. This is an indication of relationship, that God is saying, Cyrus, we've got some work to do, but don't worry, I'm going to hold your hand as we walk through this. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to go ahead of you, and I'm going to subdue the nations that would stand in the way of my purpose in the way that I want to use you. Because, see, God wanted to use Cyrus to help the exiled Israelites to know freedom. Now, let me say something to you. Cyrus was a Gentile, and Gentiles were not anticipated to have anything good to do or say with Jews. But the reality is God can use anybody, no matter what your history, no matter what your pedigree, no matter but the story is you've been telling yourself about your life or the story you've been telling yourself about God. God goes on to say that he's going to open doors before Cyrus. Now look, he's holding Cyrus's hand. I want you to get this image of uh, somebody writing you a reference letter and saying, hey, this is my good friend or this is my colleague. They are gifted and I want you to give them an opportunity, consider them with my highest vote of confidence. God is saying, I'm going to hold your hand, I'm going to walk with you, and I'm going to subdue the nations in such a way that everybody will know that it is God, it is me walking with you. Then he promises that no gates will be closed before Cyrus. Verse 2 says, and this is all God speaking, I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze. In verse 2, we see God who shepherds us. Doesn't that ring similar to you to Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. All that um, earthy crunchiness going on in that text, being out in nature, the water, the valleys, all of that. And you can see, he says, I'll go before you and level the mountains. What he's saying is that not only is God calling Cyrus to shepherd the people, but God is going to shepherd Cyrus. God wants to shepherd you too. God wants to lead you through whatever it is you're going through. It goes on to say in verse 3, I'll give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. Verse 3 invites us to see this God who overwhelms us with generosity. God wants to overwhelm you with generosity. If there's one thing that stands between us and God being all that God longs to be in our lives, I think it is our willingness. Remember the map of consciousness? Our willingness to be open to how God wants to show up to be open to the fact that verse 1 tells us that God wants to use us. And then secondly, to be open to how God wants to shepherd us. But then thirdly, to be open to this generous God who says he's going to give Cyrus treasures out of the darkness. That's the same word God gave me many years ago as I was living in that pit of depression. God is saying to each of you, to each of us that I want to overwhelm you with the goodness of the kingdom, that I want to meet your need, that I'll supply every need, every concern. God wants to overwhelm us with generosity. Verse 4, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by name. I surname you, though you do not know me. 
Now keep in mind this idea of God calling us by name, and, and that is that God calls us, but not only does God call us, God names us. God establishes our identity in God. One of the things that blew me away when God said to me that I'll give you the treasures out of the darkness. Later on when I was able to read scripture and I found this passage and it said, though you do not know me. See, normally you are named by your parents. You are named by a family member. Some get named by their godmothers or godfathers, but often you are named by someone who knows you and that you will ultimately get to know. But God says in this text, I'm naming you, I'm calling you, I'm giving you an identity, even though you don't know me. For me, it was one of the most devastating moments of my life when God came and said that part of that text to me as I was reading it, even though you don't know me. You see, because at that point I'd accepted Christ as a child. I was seven years into ministry at St. John's and had a family and married with to Rudy and doing all this stuff in ministry, teaching two Bible studies a week, preaching every other Sunday between Rudy and I rotating. And so to hear God say, but as I read the text, y'all have heard me talk about Lexio Divina, reading the text slowly and listening for the Word of God. And that particular day, when I read that text and it said, though you do not know me, it was as though my heart got ripped out of my body. I said, God, what do you mean I don't know you? And so I reread the, the passage. Maybe I missed something. He said, I've named you, I've called you, though you don't know me. And so I talk about this in learning to be. I talk about how I had to come to the realization that I had gotten some things wrong in my life. Depression became a teaching tool for me. It became the way God was helping me to understand that I had built a very small life and I had boxed myself into that life and unknowingly had boxed God out of it. And so I said, God, what do you mean I don't know you? And so then God, over time, and because I was willing to be taught, and I invite you to be willing to be taught, be willing to allow God to deconstruct the narrative you've been telling yourself about yourself, about your people, about God. And so God began to take me into God's therapy. And God began to help me to see how I had built my identity on my ability to do things, titles, roles that I played, my ability to perform well, my ability to produce good, and that that had became my identity. And God was saying that in essence, Juanita, as he was saying in the midst of this chapter to the Israelites and to Cyrus especially, you don't know me. You've been worshiping other gods. You see, I didn't know that I had set up rule following as my God. I didn't know that what God wanted was relationship, but I thought God just wanted me to stay inside the narrow lines of rules. And so God over time helped me to deconstruct the narrative that I had been saying about me first. And then secondly, the narrative that I had made up about God, because you see, my narrative about God started when I was very young. And you know, it's funny because nobody ever says to you, hey, have you grown your God up yet? But see, for me, God was very punitive. God was angry. God was seeking justice. And God was somewhere uh, between a cross between Judge Judy and Santa Claus, and either one of them could mess up my Christmas because that's how I saw God. I didn't realize that as a grown woman, I was still using that narrative. And that narrative kept me from knowing God. 
one of the neatest things that happened to me in addition to so many that I mentioned in learning to be was that during that time, Rudy would often forage for food, you know, find some fast food restaurant and bring some grub home. And so we were eating some Chinese food one night and I opened my fortune cookie and I read it, which is our family ritual. When we finish eating Chinese food, we open the fortune cookie and read the, the fortune inside, right? Mine said, rules without relationship equal rebellion. And I thought, wow, rules without relationship equal rebellion. And so for me, I thought that was a message for me about my parenting and that I needed to pay attention that I was creating relationship with my daughters, not just ruling them to death, because God knows I was ruling them to death, performance-driven mother that I was. And so I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to put this fortune cookie on the refrigerator. That way, I'll see it every time I go to the refrigerator. And it will remind me that I want a relationship with my daughters, not just rules. Every day I'd see that on the refrigerator. When I went to get a glass of water, it was on the refrigerator. When I opened the refrigerator to make breakfast, it was on the refrigerator. If I wanted a snack, it was on the refrigerator. And so day in and day out, I kept seeing rules without relationship equal what? Rebellion. Say it with me. Rules without relationship equal rebellion. And what I came to realize because I was seeing that message day in and day out is that God was talking to me about me that I had the rules, but I didn't have the relationship. And you see, what I came to realize is that when we allow ourselves to enter into relationship with God, the rules almost become secondary because out of relationship with God, out of learning more about God, there are some things I just wouldn't do anyway because of the relationship with God. God calls us and names us, creates and establishes an identity, and God invites us in verse 4 to know God. I've come to know God in nature. I've come to know God in my marriage. I've come to know God as it relates to my daughters who are now both grown professional women. I'm coming to know them in ways and now they're speaking into my life. I am coming to know them through the presence of God abiding in them and dwelling in our relationship together. I'm coming to know God even with my trainer who likes to re remind me of things I've said in sermons. I'm coming to know God. How are you willing and open to receive and to give more knowledge of God, more love of God? Are you open to increasing and expanding your story about God? Verse 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other God besides me. There is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me. This is the second time he says, you don't know me, and I'm the one holding your arm. I'm the one guiding you. I'm the one strengthening you. I'm the one that that notion of the arm, the Amplified Bible said that God is the one embracing us. Verse 7, excuse me, verse 6 says, God who makes God's self known. Verse 6 says, so that you may know. I'm doing some stuff so that you may know me so that you might recognize me. He says, so that they may know from the rising of the sun from, and from the west. So he said, from the rising of the sun, of course, that's on the east, to the west, that you will know there is no one beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Verse 6 reminds us that it is God who is making God's self known to us. You know, I'm telling you, I've come to know God so much in nature. 
watching the animals and here in Indianapolis where I'm uh, hanging out with my crew, seeing the leaves turn and watching them fall. You know, we really don't have a real fall in Houston, but you get to see God's majesty. What was a beautiful green tree and then seeing it turn red or yellow or golden and then see the leaves hit the ground and those same leaves are going to decompose and become fertilizer and they're going to fertilize that tree, empower its growth. God is saying, don't you know, I'll talk, take everything that's falling apart in your life. It'll become fertilizer for what I want to grow in you. I am God. There is no other. Notice what you're noticing about God. How is God longing to be known in your life? How is God inviting you to see some stuff about God that you didn't see before, that you didn't know before? God longs to be known. And lastly, verse 7, I form light and create woe. Excuse me, and darkness. I make will and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. God is showing, in essence, that between light and darkness, I'm in charge of that. Between will, joy, fun, peace, hope, and chaos, I'm, I'm, I'm in all of that. I'm in all of that. And I'm in all of that. And he says, I make all of that possible. I make it all happen. I'm present in it. I, the Lord, do what? all these things. God is saying that God wants us to know that God is a creator and that God is in control. That God is in control. No matter what we find ourselves in. If, I love it when the psalmist says, if I go to the highest mountain, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is another word for hell, if I'm removed, uh, uh, if I move myself thinking that, like, I, that I'm going, like Jonah, thinking I can get in a boat and get away from God, wherever I am, God is. God is saying, I'm present. I can create in anything and out of anything, and that I am in control. Nothing surprises me. Nothing uh, uh, takes me, catches me by uh, off guard. God is saying to us, I want you to, to, to know this aspect of me, this aspect that is able to take a social justice uprising and turn it into a new way of being, America. I'm one that can take a political system and turn it on its head so that you can see that I can heal the soul of America. God is saying, even in the midst of this global pandemic, count your blessings. See how I am showing up. I am God. And so my invitation to you is that as Isaiah 45, 1 through 7, help us to come to have a hope in this God who wants to be known by us, who really is laying out his credentials, laying out his vitae, laying out his dossier, letting us know who he is and how this God is longing to show up in our lives. I want you to know God is present. God is real. And this God is a God you can put your hope in. If your image of God is too small, I invite you to study the Word and to open yourself to the possibilities that God is more than you ever imagined. And that that God is longing to be known by you. So family, Perhaps you've never invited Christ into your heart so that you might start this journey of an intimate relationship with God. Or perhaps like me, you had done it a whole bunch of times, especially as a child. But now, maybe you're at this place where you're saying, God, I want and I'm willing. Do this with me. I'm open to receive and to give love. Come on, let's do it again. I'm open and willing to receive and to give love. God, I'm open like never before and willing to receive knowing you like never before. God, I'm open and I'm willing like never before to know you, to really know you. May 
God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of this word. I love you, family. I thank God for you. And just remember, when it comes to me loving you, there's what? Nothing you can do about it. Make it a great one.